Right. Folks are like they're still joining, but we're going to go ahead and just get started just to be mindful of our short hour we have together. Um, first of all, again, welcome back to everyone who joined us last week and welcome to folks who are just joining us this week. Uh, I'm Parker Bowling with the Earth and Spirit Center, uh, and I'll be supporting this conversation with uh, Joe Phelps, who's our justice coordinator. So we're looking forward to the second week and also apologies for folks who joined us last week with the technical issues. We're hoping, fingers crossed, that we've ironed them out this week. Uh, so we look forward to hopefully a smoother presentation. Um, is continuing last week, we will also be doing a Q&A as well at the end of the session tonight. But if any questions come in throughout the course of Joe's presentation, you all can go down to the bottom of the Zoom screen and there's a Q&A box. If you all just type in your question, you can send it anonymously or with your name. I'll be monitoring those throughout the session. And if something timely pops up, I'll try to be able to ask Joe that in between his slides. Um, so we want to have this as interactive as we can for a webinar. Uh, but with that, I'd like to take just a, a minute for us just to settle into the space for everyone who's here. So we'll begin by either softening the gaze or closing the eyes if that's more comfortable for you. Just taking a moment out to arrive in whatever space you find yourself in this evening. Feeling your feet resting on the ground, resting on the earth below you. Feeling wherever your body makes contact with the seat, allowing the seat the couch, wherever you're at, to support you, to hold you during this hour. And then just beginning to notice wherever you can feel the breath most easily this evening. Might be the rise and fall of the belly or the chest. Or maybe the air coming in and out of the nostrils. Just resting your awareness on whatever sensation of the breath is most nourishing for you. Allowing whatever you've carried with you from your day to just settle for the next hour. Noticing what emotions might be present. What thoughts are going through your head. And just noticing as you rest your awareness on the breath. Whenever you're ready, just beginning to return back to the room. Maybe you're offering any intentions you might have for this class, things you'd like to learn, what you'd like to cultivate. Just returning your gaze back to the screen whenever you're ready. With that, I will hand it off to Joe to begin. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, folks. Um, of course, I can't see you, uh, but um, I wonder what kind of day each of you have had. I have already uh, been in the woods. I have uh, fished for rainbow trout this morning and caught our dinner, and I've mined for jewels this afternoon with my grandchildren because I'm in North Carolina with them. Um, I cannot believe that I'm here in North Carolina after what happened last week in the Highlands and my internet connection, but this trip was planned long ago, and so here I am. Uh, last week was actually for me kind of my 20th, 21st century version of a nightmare. Back in the old days, uh, my former life, uh, my nightmare, my primal nightmare was Sunday morning, I'd forgotten to write a sermon, the choir was singing, I can't find a Bible, I can't find a text, the choir's coming to the end, and it's time for me to preach. Uh, today's nightmare is um, I'm speaking to 300 people on a webinar, and all of a sudden I realize that Parker, my associate, is not moving on the screen, and a message pops up that says, connection not stable, and suddenly messages, text messages, and my phone start ringing at the same time, and that is my 21st century nightmare. Um, I was already kind of amped up last week and jittery because um, of this class and the um, 
enormous opportunity to say something to people in these four one hour sessions that might help us uh, walk this anti-racism path in a new and fresh way. I'm keenly aware that every day, great books, great videos, great op-eds, lots of data uh, are available in ways that are a lot more entertaining and informational than what you're gonna get in this hour. And so uh, I had a kind of an ego thing going, trying to wanna to say something unique and novel. And I'm socialized, which is our topic today, I'm socialized as a white man to expect life to go right for me. Uh, rules are, are made that come out right for me. So if the, the internet is supposed to work, then daggone it work. And when it doesn't, uh, well, let's just say that first session was helpful for my growth experience. In that first uh, class, I hope I didn't freeze up during the uh, part in the presentation where I talked about one of those pivotal moments in my life. It was when uh, we were having a book study on the book, The Half Has Never Been Told. It was um, an Empower West event. Jason, if you could put that first screen up, if you would, please. Is it up? If it is, I'm not seeing it. I'm gonna trust that it's up. Uh, okay, the next one. Can you put the next one up? It's the story of uh, how uh, the United States was formed basically on the backs of slaves and that our economy uh, was built on slave labor and goes into great detail uh, outlining that for us. I told the story about how we had a book discussion, black people, white people, after the event and we broke into small groups and how one uh, man, a black man, said in exasperation when a woman said, I just never heard any of this information before. He exclaimed, how could you not know? How could you not see? How could you not relate to the experiences and the horrors of slavery? Why do you think they would be slaves unless it was that horrible? Pivotal moment in my life. Here's another pivotal story in my life, and it's actually from like 25 years ago, back in the mid 90s in Austin, Texas. My, older, my oldest child, Kara, went to a predominantly black high school, uh, LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson High School, on the other side of town for us, little sidebar. That's often what people say when they want to explain, I'm not a racist, I sent my kids to a black school. My daughter did go to the school, it was a great school for her, it was very formative. She was a cheerleader, she was the only white girl on an all black squad and it was great fun for her. So we went to football games. But when homecoming came around, she was nominated to be on the homecoming court and we knew the game was gonna be sold out. So we bought a block of tickets in advance for us, our family, our friends, so we could all go to this game together and celebrate. So we get there a little bit before kickoff, our little entourage arises, arrives. Uh, my friend Kevin Cosby might call it the Caucasian invasion, these white people coming into the state. Find that, oh man, I'm getting the internet connection unstable. Are you kidding me? Parker, can you hear me? You're breaking up. You were, it was all clear. And then just started breaking up talking. a minute. It just started breaking up a minute uh, ago, Joe. Okay. I'm going to keep my cool. Uh, uh, we climb up to the bleachers and we find that the seats are already occupied. An African-American family is there. They've got their blankets spread out, their cushions. And the woman says to me, I, I sit here every week. This is, these are our seats. And I say, I'm sorry, but as you know, this week seats are reserved and I show her the tickets we, we bought her every week, she said. No problem, hey, I said, I'll, I'll just go get it. Yes. Hey Joe, you're still freezing turn my up screen a bit. Off. Or, yeah, uh, turn your video off if you don't mind. See if that okay. helps. Thank you. Yes. Let's pray that that helps. And I'd, I'd much rather do this without y'all looking at me anyway. So. It sounds better so far. Let's go with this. There you go. Was I saying something? Um, I was telling the story about uh, the LBJ High School game. 
I apologized to the woman and said, we've got these seats reserved. And she said, well, these are our seats. We always sit here. So I went to get the usher to clear it up and the usher went up to her and again, she refused to move. And the usher looked back at me with a, an expression that said, what do you want me to do? And I remember looking back at him and thinking, I want you to fix this for me. I want law and order. I want to sit in the seats that I reserved. I want to enjoy the game and hope my daughter wins the homecoming queen. I want my privilege. 25 years later, as I think of that story, I see that moment from different angles. Of course, I see my view, righteous, confused, wanting to resolve the issue. I saw that dear woman sitting there who sat there every week who wasn't trying to be ugly. She's just saying, I'm not moving. I see my wife, Terry, and my friends and the others who are caught in the middle of that story. And I can see the usher who was a black man. And I remember how grateful I was to him when he said, let me find some other seats for you all. I offer that story today because it's incomplete, it's complex, it's imperfect, as most stories about race are. They don't always resolve nicely. They're often open-ended. As my friend Chris Caldwell said, said last week, this is a journey. And so I wanna reiterate what Robin D'Angelo is doing in her book, White Fragility, where she talks about white fragility, but she talks about it in a way that de-shames it. She reminds us that uh, we were raised in racist culture. So racism is inevitable. We have racist worldviews. We develop racist understandings. We have investments in systems of racism that serve us well. And we feel entitled to things and deserve things. We want those seats. We want things to work out for us. That's just the world we live in. And it's better for us not to see how white identity benefits us. But until we do, we can never change it. So her point is not to feel guilty about all of that, not to be ashamed of where you were born or the place you live, but rather to allow those feelings to be transformed. Because guilt operates by force. Guilt doesn't redeem, it doesn't repair, it doesn't heal. Guilt becomes a form of violence. And we become defensive when we're guilty. People, people aren't changed through, through feeling guilty. They, they just become more defensive and intractable and shamed. What I want to invite us to, and why this stuff is so very important to me, is because I think that only honest, tough love awakens people to that part of themselves that allows them to experience the human connection and the oneness that allows racism to dissipate and anti-racism to take its place. Honest, tough love recognizes that in the Garden of Eden, when Cain asked God that question, am I my brother's keeper? That the answer echoes through time. Yes, yes, we are our brother's and sister's keeper. And to awaken to this is what Jesus called the pearl of great price. Because even while we're doing other things for justice, I, I find myself these days with a lot of different hats on, doing a lot of different things. I'm part of a group demanding answers from the mayor. And ironically, I'm also meeting with the mayor and other uh, faith leaders to talk about moving forward. Uh, and, and, and my wife and children and I have been involved with the protests and perhaps you know the story of Tyler Girth who was killed on Saturday at the rally at Jefferson Square. My, my son Stephen was standing next to Tyler, his high school friend. They had just connected some couple of weeks earlier at another protest and we're talking about uh, their common connection there when the first shot was fired. Everyone hit the ground and retreated and when Stephen returned to where they'd been standing, Tyler had been shot and he was dead. So this stuff is not just um, 
about theory. This is about life, and this is about a call to be our best selves. What keeps us from being our best selves? What does it mean to be white? We're going to talk about race, white supremacy, and socialization. And let's start by watching this. Uh, it's about a six-minute video. It's a little, it's a little over dramatized for me, but uh, stick with it. The content is good. It's about six minutes. Jason. and revolutionary ideal at America's core. Yet it was written at a time when some inhabitants were held in bondage and others were being dispossessed of their lands. How did American society justify unequal treatment based on skin color and national origins? How did it reconcile that contradiction? America created a story, a story of race. Race was never just a matter of how you look. It's about how people assign meaning to how you look. We have the idea that it's somewhere written in stone, that there are these fundamental differences between human beings. We don't realize that race is an idea that evolves over time, that it has a history, that it is constructed by a society to further certain political and economic goals. Created over four centuries, race has become a powerful and enduring narrative. Moments in America's past reveal how this idea took hold and became the lens through which we view our world. Thomas Jefferson, a Virginia slaveholder, penned the revolutionary words proclaiming human equality in the Declaration of Independence. He also wrote a lesser known influential document, Notes on the State of Virginia. Written in response to questions from France about the American colonies, the book reads as a kind of sales pitch for America. Notes on the State of Virginia was not about race, but among Jefferson's descriptions of rivers and seaports, mountains and climate, he expressed his views on the inhabitants of the new land, people from America, Europe, and Africa. I advance it as a suspicion only that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to the whites in the endowments both of body and mind. It is possible to make the argument that Thomas Jefferson is the first person to truly articulate a theory of race in the United States. And in effect, he has to do so. He has said in the Declaration of Independence that we are all created equal. Well, if in fact we're all created equal, and if in fact we're entitled to our liberty, then how can he possibly own 175 slaves and going up to about 225 slaves at the peak of his slaveholding? In notes, Jefferson's words appeared to justify slavery at a time when many were admonishing the founding fathers for espousing freedom, while continuing to support a system of human bondage. The problem that they had to figure out is how can we promote liberty, freedom, democracy on one hand, and a system of slavery 
and exploitation of peoples who are non-white on the other. And the way you do that is to say, yeah, but you know, there's something different about these people. This, this whole business of inalienable rights, uh, that's fine, but it only applies to certain people. The moment when we become a nation is critical for our understanding of both American nationality and race. We accept the notion that all men are created equal, but then perhaps some of those people who are enslaved are not quite men. That is, we'll keep our ideas of American nationality, but we'll write certain people out of the human family. So Thomas Jefferson, uh, as the as the author or the uh, video said, is the first person in uh, the United States, at least, to offer a theory of race. His suspicion uh, created such a cognitive dissonance that we are still reeling from. Here's the the juxtaposition: on the one hand, all men are created equal, and then his other statement: blacks are inferior to whites in body and mind. The, the video reminds us of how it, this was an opportunity for Jefferson to kind of have his cake and eat it too, because of course he had up to 225 slaves, including Sally Hemings. So how does an individual or how does a nation resolve this dilemma? How do you get out of this conundrum? How do you continue to see yourself as genteel and self-respectable and even Christian while having this uh, challenge? And the answer is simply to write people out of the human family. Uh, Jim Wallace says that this is America's original sin, uh, as the book said, or the video said. Now, people assign meaning just based on how you look, so that race is an idea that evolves over 400 years, and it's constructed by society to further political and economic goals, or in other words, greed. Greed. For 400 years, the enduring narrative has been a distorted lens about how white superiority took hold and, and became what it is today. We see, but we don't see. There's a, there's a line in the Bible, it's in Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, I think even Jesus quotes it. They have eyes, but they do not see. So, to justify and defend the argument uh, of uh, writing blacks out of the human family, they do two things. First, they talk about science. Uh, and there is uh, a lot of, of historical work that's been done on the uh, medical uh, reports that came out of, especially the Ivy League in the uh, early 1800s, basically bogus science um, that, uh, again, is about uh, constructing society to further political and economic goals. They, they came up with explanations for why black people were physically inferior to white people. You can do a lot of work on that. The second area though is religion. And that's uh, the area that I find most uh, damnable. Uh, and as a, a minister, this is a spe it's, hits especially home for me uh, because and especially as a graduate of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, because Southern Seminary was the epicenter of the moral and theological justification for slavery. Jason, if you can hit the next slide, that is uh, a photo of the Baptist Seminary I attended when I was in the seminary. And that's, that is the cover of something called a phone book. Back in the old days, people had something called a phone book. And that's the cover of the 1978, I think it is, phone book. Because Southern Seminary was so central to the city of Louisville. That was before the fundamentalist takeover. About this time, Southern Seminary was trying to uh, reframe their understanding of the Christian message. Uh, Martin Luther King had been invited to campus. They were making some strides. They had created a school of social work. They were starting to understand. But at the center of what Southern Seminary is, 
is that it was founded on the eve of the Civil War in Greenville, South Carolina by a name, man named Richard Furman. Next slide, please. Here's Richard Furman. Whoops, oh gosh, what did I just do there? Um, Furman, uh, in 1822, uh, writes this letter to the governor of South Carolina as his explanation, his biblical ex explanation for why slavery is justified by the Bible. Baptists, you know, are people who say the Bible said it, I believe it, that settles it. So Furman, uh, in 1822, I think it's the same year that in Greenville, South Carolina, or Charleston, uh, South Carolina, um, uh, uh, Denmark Vesey had his slave revolt. But Furman writes, surely where both master and servants were, were Christians, as in Paul's letter to Philemon, they would have enforced the law of Christ and required that the master liberate a slave in the first instance. But instead of this, they let the relationship remain untouched as being lawful and right and insist on the relative duties. So, in proving this subject justifiable by scriptural authority, its morality is also proved for the divine law never sanctions immoral action. The Bible said it, I believe it, that settles it. Uh, they, everything else about religion basically was thrown out in order to keep this premise. Uh, James Boyce, the next slide, if you will, Jason, one of the founders of the seminary. Actually, let's go to broad, uh, go, go with the one before, if you don't mind. We'll go to Basil Manley. Here's his uh, defense of slavery. He says, their introduction into this country has been in the providence of God, instrumental in saving more of their race from heathenism than the united membership of all the churches which, made, which modern foreign missions have planted. In other words, but for slavery, uh, Africans would still be in their heathenism. So you're welcome for slavery was kind of his pitch. James P. Boyce, the next slide, was a Confederate chaplain. It says, it's as a pro-slavery man that I would preserve the Union. Boyce uh, has a, a library named after him at Southern Seminary, a chapel named after him at Southern Seminary, and the college at Southern Seminary is named after James P. Boyce. The next slide shows the number of slaves these founding uh, faculty had uh, at Southern Seminary, totaling 37. Uh, which is also interesting and fascinating to me because I went to this seminary and I didn't know this information. And I suppose I was incurious and I regret that, but I'm telling you this blindness, the ability to miss, to overlook, to turn your head, to look away, as it says in the Dixie song, to look away. The ability to look away is so pervasive that I was the pastor of Highland Baptist Church here in Louisville for 21 years, and it wasn't until about a year or so before I left that in our stained, realized that in our stained glass windows, next slide please, are not a, none other than uh, Richard Furman and John A. Broadus. My friend Kelly Kirby says that the system reveals a sick sociology based on a faulty anthropology that emanates from a false theology. Um, so, there you go. Southern Seminary, Louisville, Kentucky. How to justify writing blacks out of the human family. Number one, science. Number two, religion. Let's move on though to talk about uh, the social forces that leave us, that, that, that uh, complicate how we see uh, how we see things. So this is, a, actually this is a little bit out of order, but this is fine. This is an iceberg. Uh, if you can visualize this as an iceberg, uh, you'll notice that ab above the water is uh, what's visible, what we see, what we, what we can acknowledge. Uh, and what we acknowledge is really nothing. And what we see, our intentions are always good. But you'll notice that below the water, below the surface, are these, these messages, these beliefs, these images that we have that are about 
radical social racial socialization that should say racial socialization that we are socialized to think and make assumptions based on white supremacy as my friend kevin cosby says the white man's ice is always colder the white man's sugar is always sweeter let's jump to the next frame if you will jason please these are the social forces that uh, hold racial hierarchies in place and these are some that D'Angelo lists on page 20. Uh, I wonder if you, the members of our class, could look at that and add some social forces. And if you would, please, either in the chat or Q&A section, I don't know, uh, if you can help us enumerate those social forces that hold racial hierarchy in place. Between Robin D'Angelo and me, this I came up with these 10. The ideologies of individualism and meritocracy, that, it's all up to me and everyone can can get ahead if you try hard enough number two the narrow rep repetitive media rep representations of people of color we will talk about that more next week segregation in schools and neighborhoods where we we find ourselves apart so we don't know each other depiction of whiteness as the human ideal i already named that the white man's ice is always colder the white man's sugar is always sweeter a redacted American history. Um, talking to my friend Ricky Jones about all the stuff going on these days, he said, you know, Doc, he said the number one thing uh, we could do in this country to change things is teach real American history, not this whitewashed sanitized version that we have now. Number six, jokes and warnings that white people t uh, share among themselves taboos about talking openly about race. That has been, at least up till these days, uh, kind of a no-no. Uh, you don't bring this up because you're gonna co create conflict, make people feel guilty, so you don't talk about race. And if race comes up, number eight, white people band together, white solidarity. If racism is called out, white people are expected to sort of defend each other. Number nine, a reduced definition of racism. We talked about that last week. And number 10, assuming that good people aren't racist, can't be biased. I'm sure you can think of others and I would really love for you to add to that so that as we continue these conversations, uh, we can add to the body of, of uh, ideas that we have here. All of, these, all of these social forces are reinforced all throughout our society. They're present in our schools and our in the school textbooks. It's present in our churches, of course, in politics, in in media, movies, advertising, holiday celebrations, the words we use, the questions we ask and don't ask. Um, it's all there. Next slide talks about white supremacy being more than a it's more pervasive really and more omnipresent and more subtle than than what we typically think of as white supremacy when we think of uh, KKK people or or alt-right people. White supremacy is more than the idea that whites are superior people of color. It is the deeper premise that supports this idea. The definition of whites as the norm or standard for human. The people of color as the deviation from that norm. Wow. It's in, the, it's in the air we breathe. It's like the water we swim in. I love this cartoon. Uh, this comes from a David Wallace uh, uh, college uh, commencement uh, um, address. He tells this story about the, the fish swimming along and then coming across an older fish who says to them, morning boys, how's the water? After they swim on, one of them asks the other one, what the hell is water? That suggests that white superiority is the water we swim in. We don't even see it. We don't even feel it. We don't intend it. We're not conscious of it. Wallace goes on in that uh, graduation address to say the real value of education has almost nothing to do with knowledge and everything to do with simple awareness. Awareness, being awake, seeing. Awareness of what is so real and essential, so hidden in plain sight all around us, 
all the time that we have to keep reminding ourselves over and over again. This is water. This is water. If you have the book, uh, White Supremacy by Robin DiAngelo, uh, you can turn to page 34. You can read along with me if you'd like. Um, um, on page 34, she starts by saying, to get a sense of the white racial frame below the surface of your conscious, conscious awareness, think back to the earliest time that you were aware that people from racial groups other than your own existed. Think about that just for a second. You do that right now. For me, it was about, I think, eight years old. People of, of color recall a sense of always having been aware, while most pe white people recall being aware by at least age five. If you lived in a primarily white environment like I did and are having trouble remembering, think about Disney movies, music videos, sports heroes, Chinese food, Aunt Jemima syrup, Uncle Ben's rice, the Taco Bell Chihuahua, Columbus Day, Apu from The Simpsons, or the donkey from Shrek. Reflect on these representations D'Angelo invites and ask yourself, did your parents tell you that race didn't matter and that everyone was equal? Did they have many friends of color? If people of color didn't live in your neighborhood, why didn't they? Where did they live? Well, what images, sounds, and smells did you associate with these other neighborhoods? What kind of activities did you think went on there? Were you encouraged to visit these neighborhoods, or you, were you dis discouraged from visiting these neighborhoods? What about the schools? What made the school good? Who went to good schools? Who went to bad schools? If the school in your area, if the schools in your area were racially segregated, as most U.S. schools are, why didn't you attend school together? If this is because you lived in a different neighborhood, why did you live in a different neighborhood? Were their schools considered equal to, better than, or worse than your school? If there was busing in your town, in which direction did busing go? Who was bused into whose school? Why did the busing go in one direction and not the other? If you went to school together, did y'all sit together in the cafeteria? If not, why not? Were the honors and advanced placement classes and the lower track classes equally racially integrated? And if not, why not? What about your teachers? When was the first time you had a teacher of the same race as your own? When was the first time you had a teacher of the same race as, your, as yours? Did you often have teachers of the same race as you? When did you have a teacher who was not your race? Page 30, 36, she then says, reflection on these matters. If you could change to that screen, Jason. Re reflection on these questions. No, is it not there? I guess it's not there. Reflections on these questions provide an entry point into the deeper message that we all absorb and that shape our behavior and responses below the conscious level. Again, we get to that below the surface, the, the part of the iceberg you cannot see. And if we leave those things underneath the surface unexamined and unnamed, what it does is this, it basically denies or refuses black reality. We're saying the world is only as I see it. And what we're doing in that is projecting white people's, my reality onto black people. And it keeps me insulated and unchallenged. Because to face the things below the surface is to get into hard conversations with others or even with yourself. I mean, think about it. 
if you see a colleague at work who does or says something that is racist, do you want to point it out to them? And if you do point it out to them, what reaction do you anticipate receiving? Do you think the person's going to be grateful for you pointing out uh, an act of racism? Or are they more likely to be defensive, even hurt and offended and perhaps angry? Um, on the screen now is a, a phrase I'd, I'd not heard before, and that is aversive racism. And I, I call it ugly racism. Racism that is under the surface of consciousness because it conflicts with consciously held beliefs about racial equality and justice. Aversive racism. You can't even name it. You, you can't even go there. And you don't want to go there because not naming these racial issues provides plausible deniability for you. I, I, I just didn't know, you can say. But now we're invited, we're being invited to look beneath the surface, stick our hands under the water and see what, what, what else that iceberg that we are part of holds. My friend Kevin Cosby says, you cannot fix what you will not face. There is good news in, in all of this. Um, the good news is that it's possible to see. Uh, Theodore Redke says, in a dark time, the eye begins to see. In other words, if we're willing and courageous, if we'll gather in communities of support, we can begin to see uh, the racism that is, that we are just living and breathing in. Morning, boys. How's the water? It's a time for us to realize that we're swimming in the waters of racism and begin to address those things that we are able to do and act on. We're a diverse group. Uh, there are hundreds of us listening to this, and each of us has our own particular role. As I said last week, some of us will be called to stand in protest. Others will be called to be of support to those who protest. Still others will work immediately on solutions, while others will try to uh, deepen relationships with uh, someone that they've perhaps not known in the past. Each one of us has a particular uh, work that is ours to do. And uh, some years ago, I, I, I wrote a, a little chorus for uh, a, a church uh, season, and it, it stuck with me. The words continue to have uh, power for me, uh, and this becomes sort of a mantra for me. May we see what is ours to see. May we do what is ours to do. Invite us to the work of love as we give ourselves to you. And to you, you can be God, it can be life, it can be the call of justice, it can be this work of love that we are all uh, invited into. So with that, I'm going to stop for, for today. I'd love to hear, uh, entertain some questions or comments from others. So can I ask Parker to pick up from there? Yes, thank you so much for that, Joe. Um, yeah, there's been several, several really great questions coming in from folks, and in, in they're they're pretty diverse in what they're covering. So I, I'd like to cover several of them, but I'd like to start actually with what someone had asked towards the beginning of our class, and uh, they were just pointing out that there's been several articles um, coming out recently that have just been critiquing D'Angelo's work with White Fragility, um, and the person asking the question specifically highlighted the Washington Post book review. Uh, which for folks who haven't read it, basically just points out their critique that the notion of white fragility puts folks in a bind because as a white person to critique white fragility or to examine it, then often leads to accusations of white fragility. And so that's what the, the author of the book review is pointing out. So Joe, I just wanted to 
to get any thoughts you had on critiques of D'Angelo's work. If you feel, if you resonate with any of those critiques or you have any counter critiques, um, I'll just leave it open with that. Thanks. Um, I have not read any of the critiques, but that particular critique, I would have to hear it more thoroughly, but uh, simply to say that talking about white fragility creates white fragility seems um, uh, like a cop out. Uh, of course, it's going to create more white fragility. We're going to be more defensive and uh, 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 we're going to be more intractable. But uh, isn't that always the case with uh, learning new things and, and, and having to stretch and grow? There's always resistance. Um, I, so I guess I don't understand the full nature of that critique. So I'm not really uh, equipped or prepared to, to respond to it. Yeah, I hear you. Um, another question that came in was one of the participants said that they teach in a mostly white high school and they were asking, how can I raise the consciousness of white students without making black students feel uncomfortable? Wow. Um, that's, uh, that's a hard and, and tough question, but I think a good one and a good one for a teacher in, in that context to wrestle with. Um, I, 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 of course, again, I don't have the details here, but assuming it's a, a group that is uh, able to wrestle with hard uh, topics, I, I, I think I would perhaps uh, invite the conversation and, and see how the black students are responding or maybe even talk to the black students in advance to kind of get blessing and permission to, to raise the topic. Uh, one of the things that we are hearing a lot is that, you know, black people don't want to be the teachers of white people about racism, which is somewhat true. And I know there is an exhaustion level there, but there's also the reality that we haven't been listening. We haven't seen these things, uh, even though black America has been saying them to us for 400 years. We haven't, many of us, myself included, haven't seen these things. So to enter into those conversations uh, is, can, might be annoying for black Americans, but uh, I think they all, the ones I'm in contact with are glad to have that conversation. Thank you for that, Joe. We'll just kind of keep moving through um, with these. Another participant asked, how can we point out or counter racism without bringing up defensive reactions particularly if the reactions are unconscious or they're microaggressions. And just to add this in, another question was around particularly engaging in these conversations with people who identify as quote unquote devout Christians um, who could never support any act of violence at a protest. So the, the, the first part of the question was slightly different. Would you repeat it? Yes. Sorry, it, it's the, the question is generally around how can we point out or counter racism without bringing up defensive reactions, particularly uh, ones that are unconscious or microaggressions. Yeah. I, I think that um, th this, this question gets to what I feel like uh, Earth and Spirit and groups like it um, could do, could contribute to the conversation, and that is seeking those ways of uh, introducing the subject and, and uh, diving into the subject deeper in ways that uh, minimize that defensive uh, reaction. I don't think we're ever going to be able to find sort of a magic formula for how to talk about racism without people, uh, those of us who are so acculturated into a racist world, not feeling some pangs of guilt and, and uh, confusion and disorientation. That's, that's just the reality we're going to have to live with. This is not going to be easy. Having said that, I think there are ways, including being uh, confessional, uh, talking about one's own racism, uh, rather than necessarily pointing out another person's racism. Jesus said, uh, take the little speck out of your eye before you take the log out of your brother's eye. So I think coming at it from uh, a place of humility and, and being able, sharing as one friend to another what you're learning 
rather than coming off as a judge and jury is, I think, very, very important. Yeah, thank you for that, Joe. Um, another kind of small cluster of questions are coming in just around language that we used to talk about uh, in this conversation. And so folks were just wondering, someone was confused of, um, in I think part of the presentation last week, you had referred to black people using the term blacks, which they were like, is that appropriate or is that, is that okay to use? So people just wondering about that as well as the differentiation between saying slaves versus enslaved people or mm -hmm. people who were slaves. Uh, so, where if you just share a bit about language and how you approach that, and how you suggest others explore that practice? Well, I, thanks. I, I approach it with a lot of uh, humility and openness to learn and change. Um, um, I, I don't know if I, I I don't recall using the term blacks, but I probably I, I may have. I don't know if that's an appropriate term or not. I'm open to correction. Uh, Slaves and enslaved people, I, again, I'd be open to what uh, my black friends would prefer, but I, I um, yeah, I'm open to other people's uh, correcting my language there if it's inappropriate. I don't have a real uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not quite as uh, uh, big of a word scholar as, as others. And I, so I'm grateful when others are uh, able to help me say more clearly what I intend to say, so. Thank you for that, Joe. Um, I'll take a couple more questions if you're up for it. Sure. Um, another person asked, is a white person working in a nonprofit organization that supports BIPOC Louisvillians how do you suggest addressing white savior complex? Say it again, as a white person working in a nonprofit? Nonprofit organization that supports uh, BIPOC Louisvillians. How do you suggest addressing white savior complex? Uh, the, the, your, the whole white savior complex is um, an important issue that, that we need to look at if, if people don't know what that phrase means it's that white people have the presumption that they need to come and rescue black people from uh, the, the the conditions that they're in that we have the answers to provide them uh, if there's anything I've learned in the last five years is that we white people don't have the answers for uh, uh, black America but that does not mean that we don't have a role and uh, an input into the conversation but I do think that it's of key importance that we uh, recognize that it's not our job to save uh, black people. It's our, it's our role to be anti-racist and provide uh, every support we can such that black America gets the resources they need to do the repair work that needs done. It's a great question and I think even being aware of even having that uh, imagery, white savior in mind, um, is is a good ballast or a good uh, uh, a, a good way to deter our, us from entering into that space. Thank you for that, Joe. Because, because oh, as, as as is obvious, uh, when when we when we take on the white savior role, we we remain in control, and oftentimes white people want to help a black organization, but they want to control the money. They'll say, well, we'll just keep the money over here. We, we don't want you all to, we'll manage the money and we'll, we'll dole it out to you. And that is not only offensive to black uh, organizations, but it, it, it simply keeps the control in white hands and creative work doesn't get done that way. Yeah, thank you for that, Joe. Maybe just one last one to wrap it up. And I think this kind of gets back full circle to we were talking about just folks bringing a, a critical lens to white fragility and in both the Angela's work, but just the whole discussion in general. And one participant asked or kind of framed the statement that we live in a capitalistic world, but we don't make everyone claim to be a capitalist. 
why then must we take on the label of racist instead of simply saying we live in a racist world that we want to change? Is this like AA where we must claim to be an alcoholic before anything can happen? I, I'm not sure uh, if the questioner is asking if they uh, <clears throat> singularly can um, uh, reject the racist uh, claim. I, I don't want to call any individual a racist. I just know that we're all raised in a racist culture. We're raised with racist assumptions and uh, that's our, that's the reality in which we live. So I, I'm not trying to pigeonhole anyone with that. That's just the water we swim in. Yeah, thank you for that, Joe. Um, yeah. With that, do you have any final thoughts? I want to be mindful of everyone's time here. We got to quite a few of the questions, or at least the areas of questions. Um, other folks have just commented on. Um, there's a lot of folks who responded, Joe, to that list that we had, that you had up on the slide earlier yep, of okay. social forces. Um, so do you want me to just read a couple of those? Yeah, that would be that? excellent. Let's hear some so, other suggestions. Yeah. Um, so folks, I'll just read a list with this. Um, standards of culture, especially that in the southern U.S., uh, naming public places, streets, school buildings, monuments af after white people. Yes. Um, whitewashing of entertainment, for example, white actors voicing black characters in animation. Ah, um, good. Banking and, banking and mortgage practices that marginalize black and indigenous uh, communities of color. Um, yeah, there's quite a few. It's also coming in the, the chat as well. Um, let me scroll back up. Yeah, same a lot of banks and capitalist institutions, the depiction of Jesus and artwork. I thought was an interesting one. Uh, redlining, um, assumption that folks of color are always a threat. Um, so in education in general, our ed public education system and our private education system. Uh, social media, the unfriending of people that have racist outlooks, so they can also avoid the discussion of racism and creating these bubbles. Sports, uh, pretty much all over the board, uh, really right. sparked a lot of, of interesting. Uh, someone also just uh, commented on environmental racism, so where we choose to place our pollution and other um, decisions we make that have negative health impacts, environmental impacts on communities of color. Absolutely. Uh, there was a, an excellent article in um, Center for Investigative Reporting this week about uh, West Louisville, Rubbertown, and the uh, health outcomes there that I recommend to anyone. We'll try to send that link afterwards. Yeah. So with that, uh, Joe, any final questions before we close or any thoughts? No, thank you. Next week, we'll look at um, different ways this plays out in, in uh, real life. And then the final week, we will have a great conversation with uh, Dr. Ricky Jones. Look forward to it. Thank you. Yeah, we look forward. Thanks, everyone who joined us today, who stuck with us through some of the technical challenges. And like last week, we will send out a link to this recording, as well as some discussion questions that you all can reflect on yourselves or with others uh, in the week ahead. And as always, if you have any questions, please shoot us an email and we look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Parker and Jason.